Up next on Eco Company. We've got some weird science. Eco Company takes a trip to the Joint Genome Institute. Basically, we want to determine how much of this gene there is in the permafrost. Teens here are helping scientists with climate research, and we have to say we're impressed. Plus, turning up the heat on our oceans. 80 or 90 percent of the heat that's trapped from man-made greenhouse gases actually goes into warming the oceans. NASA scientists explain what it could mean for the entire ecosystem. And forget heading to the mall after school. These green teens are spending their time outdoors. Bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation. We check in with a program that's turning teens into teachers. Then, meet one of Al Gore's new teen climate presenters. It's our very own Jordan. And she took her camera to Nashville to give us the scoop. Eco Company starts now. Gang, thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Jelena. And I'm Adam. On a day like this, there's only one thing to do power up the boat and head out on the water. This one's electric, so it's eco friendly. Okay, we're ready to go. Meanwhile, Brendan's heading inside to a national research lab. He's meeting some teens helping with climate research. Hey guys, we're at the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, where scientists are using DNA from different organisms to become leaders in environmental research. For instance, they're studying plants like these for biofuels, and they're unlocking the keys to climate change with microbes. Some high schoolers are helping them out. Let's go see what they're doing. It's a place where you'll never know what kind of weird science you'll see, or just how cold things will get. How cold are those? Minus 80 degrees Celsius. But one thing's for sure. Scientists here at the U.S. Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute are on the cutting edge of research into climate change and global warming. And that includes these two lab coats, high school juniors Lindsay Pieper and Shalini Majumdar. We've been lab partners for two years already, and like so we already knew that we worked really well together, so we we're really excited to do this together. They're helping researcher Rachel McElprang study permafrost and how it fits into the global warming picture. Permafrost holds a lot of carbon in its solid state, and when the permafrost starts to thaw, it activates these microbes which are living in the permafrost, and these microbes can consume the carbon and produce greenhouse gases. And once the greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, it can cause this positive feedback loop of thawing and warming. Lindsay and Shalini are here thanks to a joint partnership with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab BLIPS program. They're focusing their efforts on one gene in particular. They have been looking at a particular gene that some of the microorganisms in the permafrost have. And this particular gene is very important in the production of methane. It's work that requires safety goggles and gloves, not to mention a lot of precision. Basically, we want to determine how much of this gene there is in the permafrost and um, its diversity uh, among the other known MCRA genomes already. As you can imagine, you've got to keep those samples cold in a freezer like this. These right here are samples from our ancient DNA projects, so for example, mammoth and Neanderthal. How cold does it get? To minus 80 degrees Celsius. Minus 80 degrees? Minus 80 degrees. Why does it have to be minus 80 degrees Celsius? Uh, because even over the very long term, uh, things can degrade, and also we have some very sensitive samples uh, that we need to keep that cold to preserve them. Somewhere it's not so cold, in here. It's where powerful computers sequence the genetic material. So these are the machines where we actually sequence the DNA. Okay. So that is we determine the order of all of the nucleotides, the A, C's, T's, and G's, that make up the genomes of the many different samples that are sequenced here at the JGI. Essentially the information that's stored on the DNA, right? Yes, it's, it's the blueprint. The DNA is then placed on one of these flow cells and put in this machine. So in like a two inch piece of glass you have DNA? Yes. That's all DNA? DNA is on this piece of glass. Wow. Sequencing helps identify the microorganisms in permafrost soils. They're key to understanding how thawing impacts global warming. This has not been well studied because the permafrost actually hosts a diverse array of microorganisms 
and we haven't had enough sequencing capacity until recently to study those. It'll help us know how much permafrost will contribute to um, the emission of greenhouse gases to further understand climate change. It's an issue that these interns say is important. I think uh, climate change is an issue that um, everybody should know about and I wanted to study it more, know more about it. When you can put biology and re research that includes environmental perspectives with biology, I think that's really important to being environmentally aware. As for what all this research means, they're just scratching the surface. We are only just starting to understand this. This will require uh, long-term studies, not only at uh, one or two different sites, but at permafrost locations uh, all over the Arctic. And so this is a very large problem uh, in the context of global warming. And it's a good thing these guys are on it. There's another group of researchers with their eye on the ocean, and that's NASA's finest. I caught up with one scientist studying climate change. Hey guys, I'm at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is a replica of the Mars rover used to detect signs of water on the red planet. Now oceans cover two thirds of Earth's surface, so how are they affected by climate change? That's what we're here to find out. Think the beach is a great place to hang out? Well, what if they were all to disappear? This is happening all around the world. We're losing our beaches, our coastlines are eroding, uh, and sea level is definitely rising. That's Josh Willis, an oceanographer with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He studies ocean water temperatures around the globe using technology from both space and at sea. And that makes him a guy to listen to when it comes to climate change. What happens when we emit CO2 in the atmosphere is it stays for a very long time and it traps some of the outgoing heat that would otherwise escape into space. This trapped heat warms the ocean, warms the planet, melts the glaciers and ice sheets, and is the driver for sea level rise and climate change. Willis is part of a team that's trying to figure out just what the oceans are telling us and what it means for the future. Because it turns out that 80 or 90 percent of the heat that's trapped from man-made greenhouse gases actually goes into warming the oceans. So if you're not really measuring the warming of the oceans, you really aren't measuring the biggest signal in climate change. Willis says disappearing coastlines are a big indicator that something's amiss. Namely, it's getting warmer out there. Definitely since the early 90s, we can see the oceans warming as a result of human-caused climate change. That's where all the concern about sea level rise comes in. It's basic physics. When water heats up, it expands, takes up more space, and suddenly you've got more water to deal with. So warmer temperatures account for a third of sea level rise. The rest is caused by melting ice in the Arctic. So whenever ice sheets melt, whenever glaciers melt, and this water finds its way back into the ocean, it raises the level of the oceans as well. So about two-thirds of current sea level rise is actually from this melting of land ice. The Larsen B ice shelf, which you may remember from several years ago, broke up. That ice shelf was almost 10,000 years old. It had been there since at least the last ice age. We're seeing these events that are happening that haven't been occurring. It hasn't been this warm and we haven't had this much ice loss any time in the last several thousand years. NASA's GRACE satellite, which measures ice loss on continents, shows us the situation's no joke. One of the places we can see ice loss is Greenland. Greenland is the second biggest ice sheet on the planet, and it holds enough water to raise sea level by something like 20 feet. It's a one-two punch that has many researchers concerned. We're definitely looking at sea level rise in the next hundred years. The big question for researchers now is, how much? While there may be some questions still to answer, Willis says one thing's for certain. It's going to be a warmer planet, and we're going to have higher sea levels. And we'll see it. We'll definitely see it. We can already see it in our lifetime in many ways. Something to think about next time you hit the beach. What do you do after school? If you're these guys, you head outdoors to teach. Coming up, a lesson you can't get in class. And later, Jordan gets trained by Al Gore's Climate Project. Her journey to Nashville, still ahead on Eco Company.
about to meet some teens who love the great outdoors. In fact, they're out here right now sharing their passion for the planet. Let's go meet them. This isn't your ordinary game of tag. And these kids aren't really kids. They're sea life. Supper time for the fishes, go! And this is a lesson in marine biology. The guys making the rules. I love it. You've all got food chain signs ready to go and you're ready to teach. High school students. Bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation. They're part of the team program at the Headlands Institute. It's part of the nonprofit organization Nature Bridge. It's our mission to connect young people to the natural world. Adam Schraft heads up the youth program. They're basically here learning about environmental education and what it's like to be an environmental educator. Being in nature, it's just so wonderful. I, I really love being out here. So can any of you guys think of something that might be on the bottom of the food chain in the ocean? Something that might be a producer? 17-year-old Elspeth Mathau loves it so much, she's on her second year out here. Twice a week, teens meet up with younger students after school. Their job here each week is to come out and teach eco-athletics, which are interactive games, tag games, that teach about the environment to younger students. The fish want to eat you, okay? So you just want to go as long as you can without being tagged. And supper time for the fish, go! This game's all about teaching kids how toxins can move up the ocean food chain. Well, the game's called D Deadly Links, and it's all about bioaccumulation in the ocean, and they have to count how many toxins they have each time they move up the level of the food chain. The plankton who has the numbers had toxins in them, and those numbers represented the amount of toxins inside of their system. So we're just trying to show them that every time you go from a really small prey to a predator, toxins will accumulate inside of them. Eventually, that food ends up in our food chain. So why are you passionate about the environment? Well, humans are a part of nature, and we really need to protect it if we want to survive and if we want to be healthy. We need to keep the earth healthy. Now, there's more to this place than what you see here. They even have a marine lab, and I hear there's starfish in there. Let's go check it out. I know the code. This lab is home to starfish, mussels, fish, and much more and the interns get the job of feeding these critters. Of course, these guys don't all eat the same thing. There's your basic fish food, kelp, some squid, and then there's this stuff. So what's in here? Well, that's a good question. So this is oyster egg fluid, and we spray it in both tanks, and a lot of the bottom feeder animals uh, will, will eat that. Oh, and what about this one? It's called phytoplankton fluid, and that's a special food for mussels. Luckily, I've arrived just in time for their dinner. So Jelena, what would you like to feed today? Um, I would like to feed the purple sea urchins over there. Sea urchins, you got it. So Adam, what do I do here? Okay, so go ahead and just find yourself a piece of kelp there. Okay. Take one right out of the tank there, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna drop it really carefully onto one of the urchins until you see that they take it, until you see their spikes start to move, and then they're gonna actually bring it around to their mouths. They'll carry it around so you can see you can see how the spikes are just starting to move a little bit. So does that one eat it? It looks like it's going. You can kind of see it start to slide down there. How do I feed a sea star? Their stomachs are actually in the middle, and maybe if in a minute we can find one and I can show you. But you want to try and drop it as close to the middle as possible or on one of those tube feet and see if it'll pick it up. Oh, let me try a tube foot. Oh! <laughs> okay, so I think I'll leave the rest to these guys. What's your favorite part about team? the marine lab actually and I and I like pushing myself to feed all the animals and get to know them because some of them are kind of aggressive and scary. <laughs> Seriously, like I, some of the fish, I don't want to like touch them or anything but I'm getting over that. So. Just being out here is really wonderful because I really enjoy being here and just learning about the environment and nature. Intern Maya Shamir says it's up to young people to pass on what they've learned. Even when I was little, uh, which wasn't that far back ago, you know, there wasn't that much in education about it. And, you know, so we didn't know how important it was. And um, we're at a time where kids really need to grow up with it. And so they know, like, how their future will be affected by it. So why do you think it's important to have teens doing this? I think it's really important for um, 
young folks such as yourself to see environmental education as a, actually as, as a viable career and to see teaching about the environment not just to be teaching about science but to see that it's important to make a connection with the natural world for young people so that we can actually inspire them to want to take care of it, to be stewards. And that's just what these guys plan to do. Move over, Al Gore. There's a new climate presenter in town. Hey guys, I'm here at the Wild Horse Saloon in Nashville, Tennessee. And literally steps behind me is the stage Al Gore will be training us on. It's our very own Jordan. She'll tell us about her trip to Nashville to be trained by the Climate Project. Coming up. We might be lounging around on a boat. But our co-host Jordan, she's hard at work. She's putting the finishing touches on her presentation about climate change. She's one of the growing number of teens to be trained by the Climate Project, and Al Gore. She's taking us along for the ride to Nashville. Hey guys, I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee, home to the Climate Project. I'm here to be trained by former Vice President Al Gore to give his climate presentation, and I can't wait to get started. The Climate Project is a nonprofit organization that was founded by a former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. And the organization supports different presenters from all over the world that go out and give presentations on climate change. Everything about climate change from the problem, how we caused it, and most importantly, the solutions and what we can really do to fix the big problem that we've created. I was so excited when I got the email that I was selected to be trained at the International Presenters Training in Nashville. There was about 30 teens total and 670 people from all across the world. In Nashville, I filmed my own footage while I was there with a little camera and that was incredible. I'd never been on the other side of the camera and I don't know how the footage turned out. Oh my gosh, it works. Thank you so, so much, Tim. But I definitely had a lot of fun. to meet some new adults and mingle with some other youth and get to know everybody. So tell us, what are you up to? We're at the opening session of the Climate Project today. We're meeting a lot of really cool people. We are like, so excited. We met tons of people. Like There's like the professors of like, the, like professors and CEOs and there's like staff of the president. Like, yeah, it's great here. It's a fantastic opportunity for youth like us to, to meet just really experts in their field. Inconvenient Youth is a group that is part of the Climate Project, but it's specifically for teens. So all of the teens that are involved in the Climate Project are part of Inconvenient Youth. Our goal is to find the teenage leaders on the climate crisis, those who are out doing things in their schools and their communities, and then to train them to give presentations based on the science behind climate change and then uh, to provide solutions to climate change. As a Canadian, I think the Arctic issue is really important um, because a lot of Canadians forget that we have people in our country who are going to be really affected by climate change and already have been because of the melting of the Arctic sea ice. I'm sort of very interested in the idea of community and climate change to people who don't know about it. And I'm, I'm quite interested in physics, so I know sort of very explicitly we only have one planet, and so I feel it's an important thing that I should be helping with as much as I can. I know I can speak for everyone when I say excitement is in the air, and we can't wait for this amazing opportunity. I'm really excited, it's gonna start in like five minutes. We literally sat down all day except for a few breaks and listened to a wide variety of presenters who were all incredible talking about different things. Al Gore was one of them, so he gave us his slideshow. They showed us the facts exactly how they are and the huge problem that we have created. And it was shocking, it was eye-opening. It's a controversial issue, and the fact that somebody has taken such initiative on an issue that some people might not agree with you is incredible. Al Gore has been very important to me because he's kind of reached out, like no one else really was doing that, so he reached out to people and told them about the climate and how they can help. I never knew that you could write to your local politician and how influential that can actually be and telling them how important it is for you and how important you still want to have a world to live in that's clean and healthy and you want to go out there and look at a green world. And they talked about how important that was and how teens were changing their politicians' opinion on the issue. 
and I don't think I've ever sat in a room for so long for two days and just taken notes the entire time, but I also never left a place and felt, felt more inspired to really make a difference and felt that I could make a difference while I was there. It's incredible. When I go back to California, my hometown, I'm going to be telling, I'm going to be giving presentations of my own, how it is very important that we teenagers act together to help solve this crisis. Recycling is a key issue because in the United Kingdom our recycling is quite poor. Um, so I think if we can try and push that forward then that will help. To have a future we need to have to act right now in order to save the environment. We need to be respectful of everything else that we share the planet with. I think it's something that we've now got to start taking action on before it's too late. We all can make a difference together and we have the materials we just need to go out there and take action. We can act now and we want to act now. Well, that's it from Nashville, where I've had such an incredible time. I'll see you guys later. Well, that's a wrap this week. Thanks for tuning in. You can find us on Facebook. And visit our website, eco-company.tv. We'll see you back here next time on Eco Company.